You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. You wanted it, you got it. A radio program that helps teach you options trading inside and out, basic to complex. This is Options Bootcamp. Whether you want to learn how to protect your portfolio, generate income, or even become a master of volatility, the Options Bootcamp drill instructors will break it all down for you. Now, let's get you into peak options trading shape. Here are your Options Bootcamp drill instructors. All right, everybody. That music can mean only one thing. Yes, it's back. Options Boot Camp is back, at least for today. <laughs> the program where we break down all of the fun and exciting ways that you can use options in your own portfolio. Maybe you, you never heard of these options things. You're like, what are these calls and puts? Tell me more. Got you covered there. Maybe you want to, you're, you've looked at them, you understand a little bit, but you want to learn how to use these things, how to really start dipping your toes in these waters, or especially right now, maybe you're just scared out of your mind. You want to know maybe how options can play a part in these crazy markets or how you can maybe just walk you back from that coronavirus ledge. Hey, we got you covered here. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting, especially these days, the Options Insider Radio Network. You guys can get us live right now because there's no scheduled live time for the show. So we're live right now. Get it live right now or, of course, after the fact on your podcast device. We don't judge. And keep those questions, those comments coming a lot of you keep asking, when's boot camp coming back? Well, it's back right now, so enjoy it. And we're hoping to get you more in the near future. And someone else who's been asking that question, and people have been asking that question to him as a lot as well, when are we going to get more boot camp? When are we going to get more boot camp? My cohort, my partner in crime, the black-hatted one himself, Mr. Dan Passarelli from Market Taker Mentoring, as well as, of course, the author of many seminal options tomes like Trading Options Greeks and all sorts of fun stuff. Mr. Passarelli, welcome back to the Options Boot Camp Drill Instructor Proving Ground, sir. Hey, Mark, it's been a long darn time. It's so great to be back. How are you? It's great. I hope you got to dust off your hat, got to blow the dust off your whistle. I hope you got them all still in the drawer somewhere, sir. I do, yeah, under lock and key. Yes, time to break the glass. It is Options Boot Camp time as we head on into a very appropriate segment for this time of year. And indeed, for these times in the market, a little bit of the old options drills. Well, in boots, time for our favorite pastime, option drills. We're going to take the strategies learned during the show and teach you how they can be employed to achieve a specific objective. Do you hear me? Yes, All right, everybody. Welcome to the Options Drills. I, I love, love doing this show, Dan, because it just feels so so festive, so patriotic. Every episode, no matter when we're recording it, it feels like 4th of July here on the show. Options Drills, of course, the portion of the show where we explain how you can use some specific strategies in your own portfolio. We're getting a lot of questions about this kind of stuff these days, so let's get into it. But before we do that, Dan, I thought it's important, given the fact that we are coming back live right now in the midst of these turbulent, tumultuous, pick-your-tea-adjective markets that we find ourselves in these days. A lot of people have questions about what the heck is going on. I've had a chance to pontificate about this a little bit already on our network on some other programs, but we haven't had a chance for you to chime in. I'm sure you're getting these kind of queries as well from a lot of your, your clients and mentees over there at MTM. So let's start there. Dan, just, just give us your thoughts on what we're seeing right now in the marketplace, the current levels of volatility, these pandemic-driven sell-offs we're seeing in the rallies, the Fed emergency cutting rates, the market not blinking, all these other things we've seen 
that have pretty much unfolded since the last time you and I have gathered here together on the old options boot camp training ground, sir. Yeah, it's been a fascinating time. You know, um, there's, I feel like there's always sort of an ebb and flow among traders, but, but, it, but it's not 50, 50, you know, it's not even where, where traders get complacent, complacent trading's easy. All I got to do is sell puts and, you know, I make money for eight years in a row and then comes the flow, <laughs> uh, you know, where it's just like, hey, these are the times that I warned you about. Don't just indiscriminately go and sell puts and think it's going to work forever. Uh, and so it's uh, it's an interesting time. I mean, a lot of our traders are are killing it. You know, they're doing really, really great because, I mean, you have volatility. Volatility is opportunity. I mean, this is arguably the best time for option trading most people are going to see in their lifetime. I like that. I like a little bit of glass is half full, grass is greener uh, type of mentality because we're certainly seeing a lot of the opposite in the broad financial media out there, right? It's just uh, terrified people heading for the hills, going to cash, you know, uh, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria, all of that fun stuff. So it's nice to hear a little bit of a, of a glass is half full approach, Mr. Pastor, like, particularly from you, the, the black hatted one, not known for such things, sir. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'll tell you, I, I, I've got a positive attitude. Well, let's start there. You know, one of the most common questions, and don't worry, we're going to get to your questions, more of them in a little bit, listeners. But one of the most common questions uh, we're getting right now is there's been a lot of sell offs out here. I'm thinking about maybe starting uh, to nibble again at these levels, or maybe I just want some strategies that I think are pretty viable in this kind of turbulent market we find ourselves in right now. We're rallying, we're selling off, we're selling off, we're selling off, we're rallying a little bit again. So a lot of those ups and down days, plus or minus 3% days, if not more, 7% plus circuit breakers triggering. I mean, we're seeing somewhat unprecedented movements of late out here. So Dan, a lot of people are asking us, what are some strategies we like here in these types of markets? I know you recently just put out a, a whole newsletter to this effect as well. So why don't you walk our listeners through what you're looking at right now? What are your top three trading strategies for this coronavirus driven market, sir? Yeah. Yeah. I put that into our newsletter on our blog and, um, you think it'd be a good time to tell people about the YouTube video that I did on this? Sure. Go for it. Yeah. So I, I also put together a YouTube video. It's pretty short and we're going to cover all the strategies I talked about here. But, um, if you want some more information, Go to my YouTube channel. It's just simply youtube.com slash market taker mentoring. And uh, the specific video is three strategies for trading options in the coronavirus market. So the three strategies that I'm looking at now and I'm using um, mostly, I mean, there might be a couple other ones that I'm squeaking in now and then, are three. There's selling puts to scale in, and that's my sort of investing strategy throughout this. And then the two trading strategies, one of them is selling, uh, excuse me, short-term overbought and oversold breakouts. And then the third one is buying straddles selectively. So let's start at the beginning, sir. Everyone's asking about selling puts. I think everyone's kind of go-to premium harvesting slash getting long uh, strategy is selling that old put. Let's start there. Let's let's walk us through uh, you know selling puts to start nibbling at those long equities again, sir. Yeah, so we've ta- I mean those of you guys who have watched um, some of our our boot camp podcast episodes in the past, you're familiar with the um, the MCHAM smart income system, which is my covered call and cash geared put selling strategy. So I I I use that every single day in my IRA. Now a while back. I ended up getting assigned on some calls, and, and usually that's part of the plan. But this time, I ended up staying out of the market, and I, I actually kind of got out of the market a little bit early. Um, and and when the market kept rallying, you know, a couple of months ago, we're talking like December, January, uh, I was like, oh, man, you know, I kind of gave up some opportunity here, um, and I was looking to scale back in. Enter coronavirus. So what I have done is – when, when, when the bad news comes out, when the market pulls back, when implied volatility jumps up sky high, I, I've sold puts. And, you know, because I was scaling back into the market, 
you know, I'm, I, I'm now looking for the exact bottom. Probably we haven't found the exact bottom just yet. But scaling back into an investment that you previously got out of, that works fantastic for your long-term strategy, especially in an IRA. It works well for two reasons. One is because if you have idle cash sitting here, I mean, look, coronavirus has two potential outcomes. One is the thing happens and then it goes away and the market goes back up. The other scenario is it's the end of the world and, well, you don't really need money if the world ends anyway. So I'm banking on scenario A. So being able to sell extremely overpriced puts right now and and hoping to get a sign, but if I don't, that's okay. I'll just do it again tomorrow after they expire. It, it, it's really, really worked great. It's enabled me to get back into the market at low prices while bringing in you know, historically low prices for recent history while bringing in extra profit. Uh, I've been doing that in spiders again, just to scale back into equities in my IRA. But I've also done this with, um, with USO because I mean, that's sort of another problem unrelated to coronavirus. Um, you know, it has to do with the oil wars going on right now. Perfect timing, but it actually is perfect timing because the price of crude is near, cost. It's near the cost of what it is to get it out of the ground. So selling the seven strike puts in, in USO, which I've done for this coming expiration and next Friday's expiration, works freaking great. I don't like to say the famous last words, how do you lose? But in the long run, I'm trying to figure out how I can lose. Yeah, USO is one of those interesting ones. I didn't even mention that at the top of the show. Of course, we've had other exacerbating events that are driving uh, the markets uh, ever downward on top of the coronavirus death spiral that the markets seem to be locked in. This has, of course, been uh, driven even further to the downside by this price war, effectively, between uh, Saudis and OPEC versus Russia. And that, of course, is laying on uh, the markets as well. And, of course, you have other issues lurking out there, the, the the ongoing domestic political fray, which is still being priced into the volatility futures out there, which is kind of interesting. So it's not all coronavirus. It seems like it's mostly coronavirus, especially in the news uh, these days. But interesting stuff. So definitely, Dan, that's one of the more common questions we get these days is using puts to start nibbling or, as you put it, scaling back in at these levels. And at a name like potentially you want to – you maybe think it is at near rock bottom, like if you think USO is one of those ones, for example. Maybe that is one. I know USO was uh, trending pretty low. Not, not always my favorite – my favorite uh, name for uh, trading oil because it has a lot of issues that are inherent with a lot of these ETPs that try to replicate positions and other things like VXX and others. But it has taken quite the drubbing trading shy of 7 bucks. It got down to as low as, yeah, 6 and a half, So 6.97. It's actually off a little bit off the bottom, but still well off where it was trading just uh, a month or so ago, which is 13 bucks, pretty much cut in half. So if you think there's a rebound there, or perhaps you're not too concerned about picking up USO around perhaps a three or four. Maybe some short puts are a way to play there. Uh, number two, uh, Mr. Dan, on your list of your top three trading strategies, you term this short-term overbought and oversold breakouts. So what are you talking about here, sir? So what we're seeing here, here throughout this whole coronavirus thing is we're seeing big moves up and down. And it makes perfect sense because – Nobody really knows what's going on, you know, like obviously this is going to have an impact on on the economy and it's going to have an impact on stocks and it's going to affect the next earnings cycle for sure. But how much? Nobody knows. So we're seeing like we're seeing scenarios where the market heads lower, heads lower, and it gets to the point where it blasts through oversold technical indicators and those are great opportunities to – to do things like, well, there's a number of things. For example, today I just sold a uh, put spread in uh, Netflix. Uh, sold, the put, sold the 320 puts that expire this Friday and bought the 310 puts expiring the same day. You know, with, with the market oversold and Netflix being one of the strong stocks in the market, I love selling that extremely high implied volatility. I was like able to take I was able to take half the position off for about a 40% of my max profit today within a couple of hours because the market just moves so fast. So when we get to these overbought or oversold scenarios, doing things like, um, A, 
selling put spreads when oversold, selling call spreads when overbought, or because the market moves so much, even though implied volatility is high, there are some cases where I don't mind buying that overpriced implied volatility because what I'll make on Delta is so much more than I'll lose on implied volatility, uh, potentially. Um, so just doing sim- excuse me, simple things like buying calls on a breakout or buying puts on a breakdown. Do you guys do a lot of technical analysis and, and educating over there at MTM, sir? Yeah, we do. I mean, you know, the thing is, is fundamental analysis is really, really hard to trade off of. I mean, it's a little bit easier when it comes to long term investing, but not something that I'd call myself an expert at this point in time, on, although I am a student of it. Um, so I just love looking at the technicals because all the smart people and all the not so smart people who did all the research and did all the trading in the underlyings. Like you look at a chart and that's just a roadmap of what they did. It gives you an idea where the buy orders and sell orders were, you know, you combine that with volume and some of the indicators, like it gives you all the information about what's going on in just a nice little graphic display so that, you know, you can't outsmart yourself when you're looking at fundamentals. I mean, you know, uh, ask the audience sort of rhetorical questions since, well, you can't answer back since it's a podcast, Um, you can answer in your heads. But, I mean, how many of you have ever read a news article on something and said, oh, yeah, geez, boy, I'm, I'm so bullish on this stock. It sure looks like it's going up, and you buy it, and two days later, it pulls back 10%. You know, like the same thing happens to, to me, too. Like I, 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 don't, I don't know how to interpret the news. I'm not really great with reading financial statements. So the tool that I have at my disposal is technical analysis, and, and, and so I get good at that. There you go. So that's strategy number two of your top three coronavirus strategies, sir. Let's get to number three, which it's funny you put this one. I saw this in your list and I thought this was kind of interesting because it's not a strategy we talk about in glowing terms all too often. Uh, But I actually – someone wrote in about this exact strategy on one of our other shows a week or so ago and I actually did discuss it now. They said, what's a good use case for buying straddles? And I said, actually right now is – Kind of like the textbook use case for when you might want to own a long straddle because it seems pretty darn expensive and it sure is. But on the flip side, we're moving enough to pay for it. So uh, these are – I'm not always or pretty much really ever – that shows you how historic these markets are because I'm not really out here usually banging the drum for long straddles too often. But in these markets, Mr. Dan, I think you can convince me. So go ahead, sir. Convince me. Why should I be buying straddles right now? Yeah. And, you know, I go into a little bit more detail on the YouTube video, but like, so here's the thing, like Mark, you and I have trash talk straddle so many times on this show um, because they're tough to trade. You know, they're tough to trade in in most markets. And I mean, they're not super easy to trade in, in these markets, but they're easier now than ever. And and it almost feels ironic because the reason that like you and I have, uh, uh, and you know, not to put words in your mouth, so definitely correct me if I'm talking out of school here, but you know, for me anyway, the reason that we have trash talked straddles in the past is because when you want to buy them, they're too expensive to buy. You know, like when you're looking for this, vol- you know, for, for a big move, which is what the profit and loss diagram shows works for straddles, the implied volatility gets so high where it's like, yeah, I mean, this has to move 12 standard deviations for me to make anything on it, you know, maybe not 12, but you get the idea. But right now, See, here's the thing. Like if you dig into the options pricing model, like that's like it's basically really all about straddles when it comes down to it. But it includes dynamic hedging. You know, it kind of includes like the underlying stock going up and down and you dynamically hedging. But when you get markets like this where it can just trend, you know, it moves three percent in a day and the next day it might move in the same direction another three percent. It's worth buying the overpriced implied volatility. So, yeah, I mean, in the YouTube videos, I give, I, again, I go into a little bit more detail, uh, not a ton, but a little bit more um, to kind of give you some, some, some tips on, on how you might, you know, how you might be able to use these and, and, and how to set some price targets. Yeah, you know, because you're right. When you want to buy these is usually <laughs> when they're super overpriced and it has to move heaven or high water to to really make these things pay off. And, of course, you have the decay. But in the markets like this, you're going to be a little bit insulated from that decay, listeners, because there's vol and there's a lot of vol in the markets and it's not really coming out 
super fast or really anytime soon. So that insulates you a bit from the decay, which is usually a number one concern when you're buying a straddle. You're buying two at-the-money options after all, right, listeners? So that's where decay is usually the most rapid. Theta is not your friend when you're buying two at the money options. But if you have enough movement, enough volatility, that theta is going to be muted. And of course, the movement allows you to do a couple of things. You could scalp around it, which is the way a lot of people like to trade straddles. You have long gamma, so you could buy stock low and then sell stock high against that long gamma position and scalp around all day. Or if you to take advantage, if we have some directional markets like we kind of have right now, everything's selling off, you can just take advantage of that size directional move to also take off the juicy leg of the straddle. So a lot of things you could do with that position that in a normal market environment, I would say you'd be crazy to talk about buying straddle. In fact, how many times have I said scammers have made livings for decades out there saying you can make money in any market condition using options. And usually they're talking about buying straddles and they're not talking about all the downsides we just talked about. But in this environment, again, this is a bit of an aberrant scenario. In a quiet June month, for example, no no pandemic lurking. You're not going to hear me talking about buying straddles. But right now, when it's all hitting the fan, correlations go into one, things are moving, vol is increasing, theta not really coming out in super huge chunks anymore, long straddle could make some sense. This is obviously a question we've been asked a lot of late, Dan, what are some interesting options, trading strategies uh, to use in this environment? I, I concur with a lot of yours here. Another one I've been, people have been asking me about is, you know, I, I, I want to start maybe nibbling again, but I'm not really sure. I don't want to catch the old fallen knife. So maybe they're a little bit leery to just straight out come up and start blasting out on some short puts. So obviously a couple things you could do. First off, you can turn that short put into a put spread if you're concerned that perhaps your analysis was off. So instead of just selling, let's say, a 10% out of money put and XYZ name, you're concerned maybe it might drop 15 or 20%. In which case, maybe you sell a 10% out of money put, you buy a 15% out of money put just in case. Just in case the worst comes to pass and you're wrong. That's one way to mitigate your risk. Obviously, you're not going to get all the premium you may want, but at the other end, you're protected against a extreme adverse reaction. You're going to lose value of whatever that spread is, the width of that. But outside of that, you're not going to lose your house and your kid's college fund and all that other fun stuff. Another way to structure a short put with a little bit more cushion, a little bit more wiggle room, which I think is useful in times like these because none of us really know where the bottom is. We don't know what the full impact of this disease is going to be. We just saw this this morning. It was classified as a pandemic now by the White House. We're seeing areas of the U.S. being quarantined now for the first time. We see Italy, effectively the entire nation, is in lockdown. So we're hearing a lot of dire things that are saying it might get worse before it gets better. So you might understandably be a little bit nervous about just selling straight up downside puts. So one way you can get a little bit of cushion on that is to do what we call the ratio put spread. So now instead of just selling one let's say uh, 20% out of the money put. Let's say you're extremely nervous. You can buy one, let's say, 15% out of the money put now. And now I know what you're going to say. Oh, that's really expensive, right? That, I don't want to just go out and pay for puts because that's expensive. Well, that's where the ratio portion of this strategy comes in. Now you can turn around and sell two, 20% out of the money put. So you can structure it however you want. Maybe you're concerned 20% is not enough. Buy one, 20%, sell two, 25% out of the money puts. However you want to structure it. If you start looking at your names and looking at the put skew, the downside puts you. You'll see if you start playing with how you line up these strikes, you can actually make these ratios a work towards your favor. Where most times you can probably get that 2x to at the very least pay for that one put. That's the one way you want to set this up. You don't want to do a debit for this if, if you can at all avoid it. You want to, this is at the end of the day, should be a little bit of a premium neutral, if not a bit of an income strategy. And then also if you structure it, a little bit more aggressively, you can actually probably get a little bit of a credit out of this. Now, of course, you can see where I'm going with this. You bought one, you're selling two puts, so you are still going to be net short, as we call them, units, once you break through that farther downside. Let's say in our case, go back to our initial example, buy one 15% out of the money put, let's say in SPY, sell two 20% out of the money puts in SPY. Now, if you break through 20%, you're going to start, you're going to be long now, you're going to start losing money from that point. But remember, you have that spread you just bought above that, and that's, that's what I talk about with giving you that cushion giving you that wiggle room, that 15 to 20% put spread you just bought, one-to-one, that made money for you all the way down to the 20% out of the money strike. So now as you break through that strike, you have some profits in your back pocket to help cushion you. So it's a little bit interesting, a little bit more nuanced way to get yourself long and start nibbling in to an underlying, could be spy, could be apple, could be whatever your poison is, without straight up blasting out puts. Again, it's not going to give you the same income level you're going to get if you're just straight selling up puts or selling put spreads, but it's a way 
to give you a little bit more cushion. Dan, what about that thought? Have you, have you thought about using the old ratio one by two put spread as a way to start maybe legging in? Is this one you're discussing with your mentees or are you not a fan of that approach? No, I think, I think in a scenario like this, that, that can be a really, really good approach. Um, I mean, for me, like, honestly, I, I've been doing the kiss method, you know, keep it simple, silly, um, and, and just good old fashioned selling some puts, um, because like, honestly, like I, I, I want to get assigned. I want to scale back into what I sold at, here at lower prices, you know, and, and to be fair, like, and this is a very, very important point. This is long-term funds. This is IRA. This is long-term holdings. It is extremely likely that, Every one of the puts that I have sold or will sell will be a money losing position at some point in the short term. It is, I mean, it is almost a certainty. There's nothing certain in trading, but it is pretty much a certainty. But in, but what I'm doing it for is the long run to, to scale back in and accumulate those long-term buy and hold strategies. And, you know, a year from now is kind of the time horizon I'm looking at, um, looking back and, and feeling I did something smart. No, I definitely got you. I was thinking the ratio is more for people who are still nervous. They want to sell that put, but I think they're a little bit nervous. Maybe that near-term loss, it's going to spook them. They could actually make a gain on that ratio put spread if it drops a little bit there in the near term, which maybe might bring a smile to their face in these otherwise dire times. So there you go. That's just four approaches, ways you can use options and indeed different techniques, or as we call them here on the show, options drills, to incorporate options into your portfolio on these very turbulent, pandemic-driven times. But I know you guys have a lot of questions on your brain as well. You've been waiting for boot camp. So without further ado, let's get some of you on the show with a little bit of your mail call. Mail call. Time to look at questions submitted by our listeners. Oh, so patriotic. I'm waving my flag and my sparklers like it's 4th of July here as we head on into the mail call. This is, of course, the segment where you guys take the range, your questions, your comments. As you might imagine, we get quite a few of them for this show. We haven't done this show in a little bit, so we've been, we've been funneling a lot of your questions off to other shows. So you guys don't have to wait, but a lot of you wait for this show, too. So I want to make sure we get a bunch of them off here as well. Like a lot of you had a similar question to Mr. 087 who wanted to know, hey, hey, back at you. (laughs) Where's my boot camp? (laughs) Well, yeah, we wanted to have more for you. We were planning to do a lot more frequently towards the end of last year. As as I've said before on the show, it's challenging in this environment. You think it would be easy, but it's challenging uh, to sell options education to to firms out there. A lot of them don't want to sponsor it for whatever reason. It's a weird thing. I'm not sure why retail education has lost its glamour, lost its uh, luster out there, but we want to keep doing it, so we're going to keep doing it for you. As we hold these firms to the fire out there to get them, to, you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> there has to be more than just uh, OIC and maybe uh, the Options Institute over there, the SIBO, and a couple of others out there really doing straightforward options education. We're going to keep bringing it to you, and we're going to hold these firms' feet to the fire so that we can bring you more as well. Because at the end of the day, particularly in an environment like this, folks need a little bit of options education, a little bit of hand holding as well. And uh, so, yeah, Mr. 087 and everyone else who asked where your favorite option show is. We're trying to get more of them out there. In the meantime, enjoy this one and uh, we'll try to get, we're trying behind the scenes. We're working for you, 087 and everybody else. We want it more than you do, trust me. Uh, so we're trying to get it back on the airwaves for you on a regular basis. All right, next up, Ilian. Ilian says, This is nuts. Yeah, I'm with you. It's, it's nuts. <laughs> uh, he goes on to write, I'm thinking about starting to nibble at these levels. Uh, What are your preferred ways to use options now to start nibbling without losing my shirt if the market continues crapping out? I don't want to just load up on overpriced puts. Well, Ilian, we kind of just did a whole segment for you just on that. So check out the options drills just to recap. Talked about short puts, talked about ratio short puts, and indeed short put spreads, and even long, hard to believe, long straddles. Crazy, I know. This is probably one of the few times you're ever going to hear us recommend that strategy, so enjoy that one. Again, you still have to be clever with those. You can't just put them on, set it, and forget it. you got to be on top of it. you got to be sitting at your trading account watching if you're going to be trading long straddles. But that's, that's some of our ideas for you. I'm curious, Dan, we kind of just answered this once, but I'm curious for you right now, 
as you're gauging the sentiment of your MTM clients, your MTM audience, how many of them are coming to you with this type of question, saying, hey, I'm intrigued, I want to start nibbling here, versus how many of them are still kind of just saying, uh, I'm going to take my ball and go home, kind of wait and see approach? Man, I will tell you what. Um, right now, like we have had like five different people come just sort of out of the blue asking for one-on-one coaching. Uh, in our chat room, like we have a chat room for our students. Anybody who's in any one of our classes gets it for free. And people post their trades real time live, and a whole bunch of them are just killing it. You know, like and 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 it's not like they're bragging or making it up. Like they post the trades at the time to make them, and and you see how it plays out. You know, and 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 a lot of them, and a, and a lot of them are doing just that. You know, a lot of them are are, are selling puts into this. You know, the lower we go, the more they sell puts and uh, and and just kind of backtracking on exactly like the concept of this. It, it's important with all trading, but especially this type of trading right now to fully understand your objectives. When you fully understand your objectives, all the stress becomes gone because you come up with a plan that you agree with and then you follow the plan. And me. I know that in the short term, all these puts are going to be underwater and all the stocks that I acquire from getting assigned are going to be underwater. But I, I honestly don't care. Like I have not a single ounce of stress when the market goes lower now on the stuff that I scaled into. Not a single ounce of stress because I have faith that a year from now, maybe it'll take two years if, if stuff really gets crazy. But it's going to be it's the buying opportunity of a lifetime. There you go, listeners. So if you're on the ledge, maybe maybe Dan has helped helped talk you off it, just like Ilian and everyone else out here. Next up, Nick Tix. I like that handle. He he or she asking, uh, why bother with options when I can get short with uh, SDS? Uh, SDS, if you're not familiar with it, listeners, is one of these levered short uh, S and P type instruments, and there's a legion of these out there. You can pick your Pick your flavor. SDS is ultra short S and P. You can get ultra short Qs or DAOs or whatever. There's a lot of these levered instruments out there. We talked about them before. I'm not a huge fan of these for a couple of reasons. I called them poor man's options, which is effectively what they are. They are allowing you effectively at the end of the day derivatives exposure without having to have the derivatives expertise yourself. So I, I tend not to recommend these because you can always replicate this and probably do a much better job yourself using the options products themselves. And uh, there's a lot of reasons why we don't like these. The construction of these is usually often, I call them Franken products as well, because that's pretty much what they are. Uh, They are uh, constructed by all sorts of, shall we say, Byzantine permutations and calculations to try to get them to replicate a precise approach. They don't always deliver that. In the case of names like SDS and others, they also have to be very leery of actually holding these beyond, let's say, a few hours or one session. Because these things are going to rebalance, and if you're not aware of that, you could get caught up in a whole bunch of other issues just because you weren't aware that it's kind of a, a regularly rebalancing type product. So in the near term, when things are melting down, and maybe it might make some sense. I can see people liking these. People have been writing in about these and, and asking us about them. So I'm not going to warn everybody off them if you don't have, you know, feel you have the expertise to – do what we were just talking about, which is use puts to lever back in or to do ratio put spreads or things like that or long straddles, then maybe this is an alternative. But again, this is not a set it and forget it trade either. You got to be out of it by the end of the day at the longest. You have to pay attention to it. You have to be quick. Anyone I tell who's trading these things, you have to be very quick on the exit button with these if the market does turn because these things are going to get annihilated very quickly. So you have to be quick on the exit there. And at the end of the day, you know, these things also look at a lot of the markets we have right now. There's a lot of overnight risk a lot of weekend risk. These products are, are useless in that because they're going to open up already. The market's at limit at a circuit breaker like it was on Monday. This thing has already opened up. You've already missed the move. So the use case for that versus if you put on options earlier on like a Friday or something, you could have uh, had a position for that. So not a huge fan of these. They've also obviously cracked down on trading options on these things. They used to have options with just regular margin a lot of brokers on these things you were effectively trading a levered instrument on a levered instrument brokers quickly realized that was insanity 
And so now you're going to see increased, uh, you know, margin requirements on these as well. So from an options perspective, they also don't make a heck of a lot of sense. So in general, I'm much, I much prefer you going out learning from a show like this or from your broker, from an educator like Dan, and doing the strategies yourselves. In the near term, quick blush, quick trades, I can see some use cases for these, but uh, I'm not a fan. Mr. Dan, what are your thoughts here on these kind of uh, levered ETPs out there? And a lot of folks may be using them as a surrogate for options, sir. Yeah, not a surrogate. Um, and, and I won't even be as generous as to call them poor man's options. Because, look, there's two cases when it comes to trading, right? You're going to be wrong or you're going to be right. If you're wrong with these things, you get annihilated instantly. Whereas if you instead bought puts, you have limited risk. Um, so you're, if you're wrong, you're way better off with options. But if you're right, I mean, sit down and do the math. Talk to your broker as to, you know, what the margin is on these things. But I think you'll find that you have to put up way less capital to have the same exposure by using options instead of by by buying these, you know, inverse, highly levered instruments. So. If you're wrong, you lose more uh, with those. If you're right, you make less with those. So I, I, I don't see the attraction. Like it's just, it, it's 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 not logical when when you really deeply understand both of those alternatives. Yeah, at the end of the day, I think it's really just a simplicity play. People just don't uh, they don't have the wherewithal. They don't want to develop the wherewithal to do it themselves using options, which is as you just outlined, going to perform better 99 times out of 100. It's just that, hey, I can buy it and then sell it later in the same day and maybe make a little bit of money in an environment like this. Uh, yeah, I'm not – Nick Ticks, I think, no, no surprise, Dan and I, <laughs> not huge fans of these. If you are going to trade them very short term, keep your figure on the, on the trigger, on the exit button there. And hopefully, hopefully uh, you do well with it. I'm not going to – if you want them, if you want to trade them, I'm not going to talk you away from them. But hopefully you, you do it judiciously. And uh, it works out for you. All right, next up, we got a comment from, from Brett, Brett Leidendorf. He said his head is so full of COVID-19 news and hashtag volatility. He said, I just wrote this to a friend about an event. He said, thanks to COVID-19, our time to come together and socialize is rapidly deteriorating like the theta of out-of-the-money options during expiration week. <laughs> Let's hit it. Well, definitely, uh, Brett. Sounds like you're you're one of our guys. You're deep in the options weeds. Sounds like you're a little bit deep in the uh, in the COVID nineteen weeds as well. Maybe you can take a step back from that. But this one kind of brought a smile to my face. And Dan, I'm sure, as you, the author of the options Greeks tomes, probably brought a smile to your face as well, sir. Yeah, that's like options poetry, man. <laughs> that is, you know, that's a kind of an underserved market. Not really a lot of options poets out there. What do you think? Think we should break in? What do you think? Me and you, the first ever book of options poetry. <laughs> the first book of poetry, Mark, you know a tree. <laughs> yes, uh, that would be the first and last ever book of options poetry. I could think <laughs> I could safely guarantee that it would sell one copy, maybe two, maybe our moms would buy it. And uh, outside of that, yeah, that would be a very. Uh, a very short-lived experiment, but a, maybe a fun one. Nonetheless, we could reinvent, re, you know, reinvigorate the debate, rhyming versus unrhyming poetry, all that good stuff. Instead, let's keep on going. We got more of your questions out here. I'm not sure if they're all going to be as poetic as that last one, but fun ones nonetheless. Dan, you're, like I said, you're Mr. Greek, so uh, another fun one for you. This one came in a while ago. We discussed it on one of our other shows. I want to make sure we got it on this one as here as well because this is where I think they sent it in originally. Uh, this comes from Option Fighter. I like the handle. He says, hey, insiders. I guess that's us. He says, I have a question about time decay when the market is closed. I'll ask a simple form of it that you could state on the air, then I'll elaborate with the details of what I'm asking, which might be too, much, too verbose uh, to read on the air. I'll just, I'll just, we have a little bit of time, so I'll do the longer version. But his short version is that the market ain't open, time ain't decaying. Would you say that's true, false, partially true, uh, etc.? He says in more elaborate details, says, I've consumed books, blogs, and podcasts trying to find out exactly how time decay works when the market is closed. doesn't seem like there is a def- definite answer to this. Instead, there's a lot of rumbling about, quote, Friday morning, thinking about taking the day out for the weekend, etc. seems like a hacky solution. Beyond that, if time decay did, in fact, occur when the market is closed, it seems that would create an arbitrage opportunity that would quickly level itself off. For example, if time decay decays over the weekends, wouldn't everyone and their brother rush to short time decay by selling options Friday afternoon and buying them back on Monday? So that the subsequent effects on supply and demand of option prices would cancel this discrepancy out. 
when the same will also be true in the market is closed overnight, such as between Wednesday night and Thursday morning. Please advise. So uh, I touched on this a while ago when he first sent it in. But, Dan, like I said, you're Mr. Options Greeks. And also, you know, you were a market maker on the floor, so you're familiar with that old taking the day out or two out there. What do you have to say here from Mr. Options Fighter, who wants an answer to this basic, uh, basic adage of the market? The market ain't open. Time ain't decaying. Would you say that's true, false, or a legitimate point of contention, sir? Options Fighter, bro, listen. If you've been reading books and blogs and podcasts to get this answer, you need to go and look at some Options Insider Bootcamp podcasts from the past because we have given this answer, I bet, a bunch of times already. Dig deeper, man. So so look, there's a difference between price and value, right? Um, the options pricing model typically uh, – values, models, option valuations that time decay comes out every day. Anybody who's ever traded on expiration day and watched prices closely knows that it also comes out intraday, right? Like it's, it starts out on expiration day kind of leaking out a little bit in the last hour, like all the value leaks out. Um, do options – change in value while the market's closed? Of course they do. I mean, for goodness sakes, you see that right now, right? Like, do you watch the futures at night? Do you subscribe to CNBC or Bloomberg news feeds where they send you a text at nine o'clock at night when you're, you know, trying to watch reruns of American Idol and you're trying to relax and they tell you that futures are set to open 900 points lower? Yeah, the, the options are revaluing, but the price doesn't change. The price only changes while the market's open. And so market makers reacting to order flow move their days ahead by one day, sometimes two days, sometimes three days during the day when is the only time they are able to. I mean, they can move it ahead at midnight, but you can't do anything about it. And neither can they because you can't trade it then. So so like you got to think of the difference between price and value and you got to think of like what's really going on. Um, the prices can only change during the day. And so consequently, that's when market makers move their days ahead. What time during the day? Like, you know, if there's an arbitrage opportunity, we totally talked about this a whole bunch of times. There's not an arbitrage opportunity because like, because people are smart, you know, like if the days came out right at three o'clock central time when the market closes or right at eight 30 in the morning when the market opens, yeah, there'd be an arbitrage opportunity. But every single person who has an IQ above 75 would look at it and say, huh, so all I really have to do is sell options every day at 259 and buy them back at 831 the next day. And in the long run, on average, I'll make money. And they'll say, huh, well, I'm going to do that right before everybody else does. And they do it a minute sooner. And then somebody who has an IQ of 80, <laughs> who's just a little bit smarter than that guy, We'll say, oh, I'll do it one minute before that, before him. You know, like, I mean, the days, come, like, the days come out when the days come out. The days come out when order flow, when order flow dictates it, when people start selling options because they can't make money on their gamma scalping. So, I don't know. That's how it works. Uh, I don't know if I'm particularly eloquent or not today. If I'm not, Go back and look at a whole bunch of previous Options Insider Bootcamp uh, uh, podcast because we definitely talked about this a whole bunch of times. Yeah, this is an interesting one. Like I said, it, it, it can only really come out during the day when things are trading, right? But it has evolved into a much more nuanced process. You know, when I first walked on the floor in the late 90s, it was kind of like Option Fighter here is terming it. Where you kind of do your trading, you go back to your office at the end of the day, you adjust your skews, and you roll the date forward one day. And lo and behold, that's when most of the theta comes out. Then obviously, firms got more nuanced with how they approach it these days. The firms are are adjusting that stuff on the fly. It's a lot faster. You're right. If if, if there was if it was just okay, two fifty nine, time to flip the date. Uh, then uh, there would be a lot more arbitrage opportunities out there than there are now. In fact, this this knowledge got so widespread. For as many people thought exactly what you were suggesting here, option fighter, that maybe there was an arbitrage 
opportunity that people started really overdoing the selling of options towards the close on Friday to the point where they were hammering these bids beyond what the rational theta would have dictated for the prices. So they were really selling not just – they were already selling on Monday's prices if not into Tuesday at those levels of decay. So savvy traders actually started doing the opposite, started coming in and buying on Friday right before the close because what they were getting was effectively a free swing of the bat for the weekend. They were already buying it on Mondays, if not Tuesdays levels from a decay perspective. So they were paying no decay for the weekend. So that if something happened on the weekend, they got a free home run or a double or triple. So people were actually starting to do the opposite because that strategy got so widespread out there for a while. That has since now mitigated itself as well. I think we're in a much better equilibrium. So it has, it has swung both ways. And I think it's, uh, it's pretty... It's pretty, uh, pretty well in tune, I think, these days. But I think, as Dan suggests, there are more episodes in this archive that you could sink your teeth into to do a little bit deeper dive. Into. And if you want just a basic, if you're saying, what the heck is he talking about with Theta listeners? Again, the archives of this show are the place to go for deep dives into all that goodness on the Greeks. So check out Dan's book, Trading Options Greeks. Good place to go there as well. So we've got time for a few more. You guys have been waiting so patiently. The least we can do is squeeze, squeeze a few of you more on here. Um, Dr. Nick, Dr. Nick, isn't that the guy from the Simpsons? Isn't that Dr. Hey, Dr. Nick? I think it is. Uh, he wants to know, what are your thoughts on the, on the Schwab TD mergers impact on the options market? What about free commissions? Uh, thanks for all that you do. You're the good guy. So thank you. We try to be the good guys. I think he's got, looks like he's got two questions here. He wants to know about the impact of that merger and then free commissions. Um, you know, I've talked about the merger in the past, um, Huge leviathans that tend to dominate the, the trading or options landscape. Let's just take the Schwab TD one, for example. That's combining two firms on the Schwab side, which is effectively Schwab and OX. I know they've effectively been merged into one, but those are two essentially options trading platforms. On the TD side, same thing. You've got TOSS and you've got the legacy TD platform. So you effectively got four options-oriented firms being roped into one. Now we have the legacy Scott trade. They didn't really do a lot when it came to options or really if any, but you can essentially add them in as a fifth kind of maybe addendum to that. So you have a lot of options oriented names that have effectively gone by the wayside and now been merged into one entity. What does that mean? Is that good for consumer power and consumer choice? Not really. Is that good for consumer leverage when it comes to things like commissions or great platforms? Also, remember, the competition in the broker space has been fierce. That has led to some great innovations for you guys, the clients, at the end of the day in terms of bleeding edge UI, lower costs for trading, all these other things like that. You know, Really great, great. If you look at what the retail can trade with now. These are pro-level tools. When I first walked into this business a few decades ago, this stuff didn't even exist for the pros, let alone their active retail gets it for free now. You put 10 grand in a trading account, you get access to all this high-level stuff. That's all because of the just savage competition in the brokerage space. If that goes where that mitigates, you're not going to get a lot of that good stuff anymore. So I'm always a fan of seeing more competition because it benefits the consumer at the end of the day. What about free commissions? Other part of your question. I mentioned low cost. I think there's a difference between low cost and no cost. Certainly options are not free. Options are still 65 cents a contract. There's no ticket charge. So maybe that's what you're talking about there. But there still is a cost for those. And I'm okay with there being some cost at the end of the day associated with options because it's not like it's a Delta One product like a stock where it's pretty easy to display and execute. Options, a lot more data costs involved. Execution is much more nuanced. Uh, You probably want a broker that's going to be able to put some effort and resources into that versus, I mean, look at at the, the counterpoint to that, of course, is the Robinhood these days, which is completely free for the most part. And They've had multiple outages, whether that's related to that or not. People are saying you get what you pay for at the end of the day. And so if you pay a little bit of something for something as high value as options, uh, then I think maybe you get a little bit better service, a little bit better value, maybe a little bit better platform at the end of the day. I know talking to some of the brokers behind the scenes, they're, they're prepping for the no commissions, but they also know that means it's going to take a lot of their resources away that they were going to spend to make a better platform for you guys and doing a lot more outreach and things like that. So we'd like to see more of that in the marketplace. I'm happy you guys are getting a better deal. I like that. But I don't want, at the end of the day, the options product to start suffer from what you guys are getting from the brokers as a result of them having far less revenue to devote to it. Mr. Dan, two questions in one here. What are your thoughts on the overall Schwab TD merger impact on options? And then B, the corollary to that, what about the, as he terms it, the quote-unquote free commission, sir? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's really hard to say. You know, like, you've got to think that a company – that's as big as and as old as Schwab isn't going to F it up, you know? 
um, like you would think they're they're buying TD for a couple of reasons. One is a bunch of options accounts, and two, you know, one of the best options platforms out there by far. You know, think or swim. So, I mean, you would think they wouldn't f it up, but hey, man, you know, don't want to be naive either. We've seen that movie before. Um, it, it'll probably be fine. I mean, as far as, as commissions changing and all, I don't know. I mean, that's hard to say too, you know, like competition is good for the market. Um, but economies of scale is good for the market too. Or, or let, me, let me say that differently. Competition is good for consumers, but you know, economies of scale can be good for consumers too. You know, I mean, there's just, when you have a really big entity like that, they, you know, they can, they can potentially supply a, a really great product if they choose to. So I don't know, you know, we'll see how it plays out. Uh, I, I kind of have some faith that it's going to go pretty good. Yeah. You're very much a glass half full guy today, which is not the opposite of your black hat uh, demeanor there, sir, in the past. <laughs> Look at you, Mr. <laughs> Mr. I guess I'll play the, uh, the black hatted one on the show today. Cause yeah, I'm a little, a little leery of, you know, we see free commissions, quote unquote. Now these fees have to come in somewhere. So they're going to start playing out in other areas. Maybe you're going to start seeing, some more hidden fees like data fees and other things hitting your account. Also, they're going to start relying much more on payment for order flow, which not exactly the most transparent of practices, and that could impact your execution going forward as well. So there are some other shoes waiting to drop on that one. But, hey, we'll all play the Dan Passarelli role today, and we'll all be super optimistic and think it's all is right with the world, because why not? All right, let's wrap it up with this one, Mr. Dan. That comes from Ala, Ala7. They want to know, interesting, interesting question here, when is the best time to take off a long put when the stock hits the strike before or after. Mr. Mr. P, I know you always have a plan in place when you're putting on a trade. What do you have to say here for Mr. or Mrs. Allah 7? And they're buying some puts. They want to know when the heck should they get out, sir? The, the question, if, if you buy a put, when do you get out? Is that, is that it? Yeah, so I guess they're saying when they buy a put and then the stock keeps dropping, when should they get out? When the stock hits the strike, should they get out before, maybe a little after? Do you, do you have a, a rule of thumb for when you like to close out your long puts, sir? Yeah, and, it, and it's going to vary market to market. You know, like I've, I, I've traded some long puts uh, in, in this market. Um, and, you know, just thinking of, of, of a pair of them that I did. The first one I did it, closed them quick and took a tiny little loss. The next one ended up holding it for about three days and, and it killed, you know? Um, so it's going to vary market to market, how big volatility is right now. I love the idea. And, and what I did with the one particular trade I'm going to talk about right now is bought some puts. Uh, I took off the first batch for something like a 40% profit. I, I took off about 20% of the position for about a 40% profit. I uh, took off the next 20% for, I forget, maybe it was like a 60% profit. Um, and then the next one went at 100, the next 20% at 200, next 20% at like 300, you know. Um, it's such a great idea to scale out if if you can. Now, like if you have a super teeny account and, and you know, you're trading one lots and that's all you can do, you know, you can't scale out of a one lot. Um, you know, you just take it off. To me, the most important thing, uh, I can give you a rule, but the rule doesn't matter. You know what matters is that you have a rule, is that you have a plan going into it. You know, like never make that decision, never buy a put and say, you know, like, oh, well, well let's see what happens. And then you have a profit and you go, Oh, gee whiz, I'm not sure what I should do. You think I should take it off? I don't know. I'll let it ride. And then it reverses and all your profit's gone, you know, or, or oh, I'll take it off now. And, oh, holy cow, I could have made a whole bunch more. And then you're mad at yourself. Like, have a plan. It doesn't, it doesn't even have to be a good plan. It just has to be a plan. And, 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 and you'll do great. It doesn't have to be a good plan. Just have a plan. Uh, true. Uh, <laughs> I like that. But he's right. You do, have, you do have to have a plan at the end of the day. Uh, you can't just buy these puts in and let the dice fly high, as Caesar said when he rolled across the Rubicon there. You have to have me buy a put. You say, hey, I want to make, I expect to make 30% on this. I'm going to close it out if I do that. And if, if it goes against me 25%, I'm going to close it out there. And you have those rules in place, and then you're good to go. Maybe, as Dan mentioned, these kind of markets, maybe you want to leave yourself a little bit of room for scaling on the upside in case you hit a home run, because 
downside puts have a chance to do that in this market. Uh, so maybe you start scaling out of that 30% and you get 50, a 2x, whatever your levels are. I can't give you hard and fast levels, but you have to have a plan in place before you do it. You can't just wait and say, oh, it's hitting the strike now. Now it's time to get out. <laughs> Got to do it when you're putting the trade on. That's the key. And unfortunately, listeners, that music means we've come to the end of this return of Boot Camp, at least for this episode, this, this coronavirus special edition of Options Bootcamp. Hope we gave you some interesting strategies you can utilize in your portfolio. Hopefully, maybe we talked you off the ledge a little bit as well here. But before we go, Mr. Dan, maybe they want to check out this newsletter you're talking about, or maybe your YouTube videos, and maybe they want to hit you up directly for some one-on-one coaching. Where should they go? What should they do, sir? Yeah, you can always find me just at my website, markettaker.com, two T's in a row, stock market. Yeah, market like stock market, taker like, you know, take what is yours, two T's in a row, markettaker.com. Uh, and you can register for the newsletter on the homepage, but definitely, you know, definitely check out my YouTube channel. It's just simply youtube.com slash market taker mentoring, all one word. And, um, and, and, and check it out. Definitely check out that uh, three strategies for trading options in the coronavirus market. There you go. Check him out. The Mecca for all of his stuff. Markettaker.com. Don't forget two T's. One T for market. One T for taker. I always forget the second T. I don't mind going this. Market taker. Two T's.com is the place to go. It's the Mecca for all things MTM. And of course, from there you can sign up for the newsletter. Don't forget to check out the YouTube channel for that video and a lot more from Dan and the crew over there at MTM. And on behalf of Dan and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for continuing to write in and download this show. You guys clearly love it. So we're working on getting it back to you on a more regular basis. I know I've said that before, but uh, we are, trust us, behind the scenes, we are working diligently. And we hope to see you again really soon for more Options Boot Camp. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>